thrust, response is engine 5, engine 3, engine 1, ladder 3, ladder 2, rescue 1. We got smoke showing. Division 1, you're on location, block 23, reporting smoke show on 727. Welcome to Job Talks Podcast. Our goal is to facilitate knowledge sharing. The views and opinions of the hosts and guests on the show belong solely to the people expressing them. We do not represent the departments, cities, or towns we work for. All right, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Job Talks. We are in the studio with a guest, Matt McDonald. We're going to let him uh, give a bio here in a second. But uh, we're here today, post-Christmas, to talk to you guys about hazmat. And I just want to say that hazmat is one of those subjects where 99.9% of the people that teach you hazmat put you to sleep and the reason that Matt McDonald is special is because he can actually teach you and not put you to sleep uh, and he knows what he's doing and he has the personality to back it up so excited to have you on here buddy thank, thank you, you very thank much you. for thank coming you in coming, Matt. Um, appreciate you so quick bio if you will just want to tell people about yourself yeah so Matt McDonald uh, I've been on the rescue for approximately 12 years about 15 total I uh, started out at a slow injured company went to the busiest and shortly after that was asked to go to the rescue um and haven't looked back since you're in a pretty I sweet think. spot right senior it's, senior uh, guy on the rescue well i'm i'm the junior senior guy junior like, senior yeah. guy. Yeah. okay so you know i don't <laughs> um, that pete? Is, is pete ahead of you no i mean as far as the rescue itself, oh oh you're the yeah you're the, senior guy and you're yeah on a i mean group there's too. one group that has seniority over me every single guy in, in right. one group has a senior over me. so uh but that that's you know hell of an honor to have that title it's I don't take it lightly, so yeah. um, that's that's really cool. Nowhere else you want to be. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, but yeah, rock star crew, um, bunch of good guys, Legitimately all motivated. A rock star crew. Yeah, yeah. We don't it. tell them to their faces. So. <laughs> I'll say it here. <laughs> it's a fucking badass crew. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, basically, heavy rescue company, all hazard. You know, we do anything tech rescue, high angle, collapse rescue, uh, anything water related, um, and then hazmat. Um, and you know, that was one of those big ones when you first get transferred to the company, it's, you know, it's like, Hey, you're going to tech school and, and right. you're going to like it or, or you're going to hate it, but you're going to do it anyways. Yeah. And it was just one of those Hills that, you know, got to get up and over it. And, um, and yeah, to be honest, I wasn't super excited about going cause it was a six week course, you know, you're home at night doing homework. You're up the next morning, sitting at another lecture and, yep. and getting in A's and, and doing this and that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I didn't go in guns blazing, you know, I didn't have this motivation that I have now, um, that didn't come till well after the fact, you know, even when I got back to the company, it was like, yeah, hazmat, it's, yeah, it, it's this big subject can kind of confusing. Right. Um, and then, you know, as, as I got exposed to more and more things, it, it just kind of got even more blurry because, yeah. you know, we'd have these contractors come in and they'd say, Hey, you know, you guys just purchased this. $50,000 device and here's an eight hour, uh, training session on it. And you, you know, you leave that training session, your head spinning. And then six months later, they're like, okay, we just bought this $75,000 device right. <laughs> that looks the same, you know, operates almost the same, but it does something completely different. Right. So, <laughs> and the way, and the way it works is completely different. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So <clears throat> that's one of those type of things we can get into where, um, you know, these devices are all trying to do their job. And it's, um, it's hard for hazmat devices to be like have an overarching ability because the stuff that you're trying to identify or why or what it is or how it's, you know, whether it's solid, liquid, gas, whatever, chemical, biological, there's not really one device no, that does everything. No. You have to have specific devices to do that. Absolutely. So there's a lot. And I, I think with. that's the future of hazmat is, yeah. you know, it's starting to see some devices that overlap. Um you know, obviously it's, that's an impossible task, you know, yeah. but, um, you know, we're getting closer and closer. Um, it's probably cheaper to have separate devices. Absolutely. Yeah. The amount right of money now, that it would right? cost it to finally get to that technology is going to be prohibitively yeah. expensive. Exactly. Absolutely. Almost like, like when thermal imagers first came on, a yeah. lot of the reason that they weren't everywhere is because they were prohibitively expensive. Yeah. I think they were like $20,000 for a tick. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was like, 
we this actually, big, you know. Like, <laughs> the first two ticks that Stoughton had, one of the bigger companies in town, actually, um, they approached the fire chief and was like, hey, what do you guys need? Yeah. And he was like, we need ticks. And they're like, what's a tick? <laughs> yeah. like, order two of them. And they wrote us a check for like 40 grand. And so we That's were able awesome. to get ticks, and then That's we still awesome. have them, and they're in these giant boxes. It's like, like those old school bullards, dude. It's yeah. like, it's, it's like this thing you like got to strap it on your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And hold yeah. It it's literally got like a shoulder strap yeah. as a backpack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah dude, exactly. it's unbelievable. It's a crew served weapon, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so but that's that's exactly it. It's gonna yeah. be yeah, it's yeah, gonna evolution. be prohibitively expensive until it becomes like mainstream, which is probably after yeah their patent runs yeah. or whatever their yes. their copyright, however it works. You know what I mean? So yeah. they can't have a monopoly right. forever. But now you can get a tick for six hundred bucks that goes on your pack, and it's yeah, it yeah. Work right. Legitimately uh, good. Uh, right, uh, right. Northeast has the like personal ones. That, we have yeah. them on all our packs. Yeah, so. which oh, is nice. which yeah. is or in your mask now yeah. and like no. integrated, yeah. integrated, which is which is awesome. So um, before we continue, I just want to say um, congratulations. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Matt had a kid three weeks ago, four uh, weeks ago, going on 20, a month. November twenty third. November twenty uh, third. Yeah, so Very congratulations, cool. man! And uh, awesome. big thank you to your wife because uh, having two under two is probably not easy. <laughs> and uh, so we're glad that you could be here. So yeah. just wanted to, before coming we got out, into it, coming so off of twenty four, um, you know, it's, a, it's like, a big big ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> thank you, thank yeah. you, wife. thank you, sir Jane. <laughs> she's uh, she's obviously a fan and going to watch this. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good, great, great. Um, so we'll send you royalties. <laughs> yeah. You get zero dollars just like us. Um, so you identified a, a gap in our particular, um, fire service. And that's kind of where you, um, inserted yourself and have had a lot of influence on hazmat operations for, for us. So if you don't know that Matt, Barry and myself are all on the same fire department. So we work together. Um, Matt and I are in the same group right now. Um, so, um, tell us about what, like what you saw in, in, I don't want to say deficiencies because it's sometimes you just don't realize it till somebody realizes it. Mm -hmm. Right. But tell us after you became a hazmat tech, you came back and you found this area that you thought you could, um, improve or like like be an asset to yeah and by no means is it you know the the sexiest position of the fire service it is you know almost it's borderline clerical but right. um you know being the end user of all these devices it, it, i kept finding you know dead batteries or low batteries mm -hmm. software out of date consumables either gone expired so you know you get that device to the wherever you need to start sampling and you know the chief's waiting for an answer and then suddenly you're like you realize you can't, can't give him it. one can't right do it right um so and i and i think it goes back to just th that one compartment where all the meters are being overwhelming to people so opening up is a crazy idea you know and busting out checking the batteries checking the software doing this doing that right. so i kind of in an unofficial capacity because I, I by no means my you know an official title you're official in my heart man okay <laughs> appreciate <laughs> I that i was gonna say that yeah um <laughs> but yeah so i just kind of um started doing some of that stuff yeah uh, and, and keeping up with updates and, and, and i think that you know maybe it's not an official capacity but i think if anybody you talk to on our job and you're like a hazmat and they're like oh it's mcdonald <laughs> you know like that's that's the go-to yeah. guy which is is a uh, i think anytime no matter what it is in the fire service when you're the go-to guy that's a pretty like high awesome like title. honor you know what i mean yeah. like a high title so um you've obviously done something right oh, appreciate so, that well deserved um Thanks. just a little photo throwing it up of uh most of your uh, most of your crew here. I don't know what incident this is. is. This the electronic scooter fire. Yes. All right. Yep. So um, this is after a lithium ion battery fire, which is I just randomly put this one up for your intro. But we talk about hazmat. That's it. Right. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I mean, right there. That's, so that's one of those current trends. That's uh, you know we're we're just scratching the surface on. Um, yeah. And and you know this this particular apartment had maybe two or three. Yeah, lithium ion batteries, whether it be a scooter or kind of like an RC yep. uh, toy car. Um, so it yeah, wasn't it wasn't, it wasn't really the fire that was a concern, but the smoke is so accurate, like toxic. Oh, it's disgusting, and, uh, yeah. and you feel it afterwards. So uh, one of the things that um, that that I wanted to kind of bring up is that the nature of firefighting, in and of itself has hazmat potential. Every now they're starting to classify every fire as a hazmat incident yeah. because of the chemicals. Not only from lithium ion batteries, but just general, we burn plastics in our homes. You know, it's not cotton and wood like it was 20 years ago. All of these things have byproducts of combustion, including like CO is a big one we all know, but like cyanide, aldehydes, um, lithium ion batteries emit fluorine and fluorine is an absolutely nasty chemical, um, for the human body. So 
understanding that we have the potential to be in these hazmat situations all the time, every single day at our work. Um, and so I wanted to show one just quick example of that. So Matt, you and I were, were both on this call, Barry, you ended up on the call a little bit later, but as a decon person, right? No, I was the unsung hero doing the rest of the calls in the city. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, no, you were chasing a guy around Central Square. There was a homeless was man in Central Square threatening people. With a pipe. Uh, with a pipe. Yeah. And I felt bad bringing that up because traffic was very busy, but I was like, I don't want to bother you guys, but there's a, <laughs> a violent homeless man running around Cambridge. I know very you're busy, close, very but if we could spare one police officer, it would be fantastic. <laughs> oh. was, he, was he naked to boot? No, thank God. <laughs> no, that's, that's like a clear sign that's, of That's uh, usually the case. Yeah. Drugs. Yeah. So in this photo, what you can see is you can see a hazmat team operating here, but that's not what the call originated as. Um, this was directly across from a fire station, originated as uh, smoke coming from a window. So this window was open. It had been rainy. Some water had gotten in. Um, crews got upstairs. They found a smoke condition, a lot of heat in the floors, started opening things up, um, extinguishing what was burning, which wasn't really a lot of actual fires, more like the chemicals were burning, exactly, the yeah. wood and things like that. Um, and then I, I remember very specifically one of the people that were up there was like, my hands are burning, my hands are burning. And like, literally it was like, I have to go and went out and it wasn't, it wasn't very long after everybody was like, oh yeah, <laughs> we're all burning. <laughs> like what is going on? And what it ended up being was that there were a couple of chemicals, um, that had gotten out of their containers in the apartment mixed with potential rainwater slash us putting a little bit of water into the floorboards to try and seeing that it was hot on the tick and just. And then, uh, and then realizing that this was in fact an actual hazmat incident, and we had I think twelve people that went to the hospital that night with chemical burns. Everybody being a hazmat tech. Yeah, and and so <laughs> so that's a, just an important aspect of that is like having hazmat resources and who does what because all of our hazmat techs were in that room and then transported to the hospital. Yeah. So we actually had to, which doesn't happen often for us, is we had to call in uh, mutual aid hazmat teams to come figure out what was going on and uh ended up being um not so bad the chemical burns were not bad at all um initially you don't know what it is but they ended up finding out it was a uh, parathetic parathetic uh, acid or something parasitic like acid parasitic yeah. acid um and then this was just like a a picture of what the potential is this is all the gear from the guys that went to the hospital that night so um i wasn't smart enough to put my helmet in the truck and it got washed <laughs> yeah. and uh fires have been down since for for will tyree but uh, did you uh did you guys go to all go to the same hospital like was this a pseudo like mass casualty? so like, they would, were talking about doing that so myself and two others went to one hospital and i think everyone else went to yeah. the same hospital together an engine company the rescue squad all at bi and, and we went to mgh with one member of uh the other squad and then myself and yeah. my lieutenant and the difference was was pretty strange too so you guys actually got in they did a whole decon shower the whole bit where we went even though we told them the same information they didn't do any of that to us and then we ended up staying there for a while so like oh maybe we should test your blood maybe we should do these other things but it didn't get treated the same probably yeah I don't know, probably the way it should have been treated at the time because nobody knew what the chemicals were right. and yeah. and everybody like the skin was turning white and like like tingling and burning so it was odd but this is the aftermath of uh of a hazmat situation. Um, obviously the turnout was good, but this is just kind of to show that any incident can quickly turn into a hazmat in the fire service. You don't really know what you're going into in these buildings. I will say probably chances in our city because of the amount of biotech and stuff we have are a little bit higher than We're others. Kind of but a unique city as yeah. far as like, I feel like the amount of hazmat that we run into with the pharmaceutical and, and biotechnical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's very unique to us. Right. Uh, there, there are, you know, we can't say that we do tanker rollovers or, Right, uh, you know anything like that, but our bread and butter, our white powder and lab calls, and that's one of the things calls. we talked about when I was like, "Hey, man, would you want to come on and do this?" He's like, "Yes," but I can't speak really to doing tanker rollovers or like shutting down valves at like facilities. Like we do more chemical lab spills, white powder mm -hmm. type calls. And yep. what's funny is you can go a couple towns away from us, and they do tanker rollovers, oh, yeah. and they've had them. You know, it's just yeah. it's just the, so the demographic and the yeah, Saugus Revere that whole area. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly, uh, absolutely. Um, and we've sent like mutual aid for foam and things like that, but that's really we haven't really got into like the hazmat and mitigation right. of that. Go foam right. or go home. <laughs> go go foam or go <laughs> home. Three. Yeah. Um. So, 
I guess talk about like what's the fire service's role in hazmat. So like where do you feel the fire service fits into like the hazmat response and like why the fire service and not um, a private company or the police or something like that? Uh, just the resources are there. You know, we, yeah. we have the dedicated and motivated individuals that want to change, make change for the, for, for the good, you know, make a rescue if possible, mitigate a hazard. Um, it's just, it's our nature. It sounds cheesy, but it's, it's what we do. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that being in place is a, a major contributing factor as to why the fire services, uh, handles hazmat right. um and you know we, we're just we, we can expand so you know we have always taken on new challenges and hazmat being one of those back in you know yeah early 70s was probably when hazmat started out right so and then you really saw it i feel like in the early 2000s especially around 2001 after the trade centers and they had the, the anthrax calls and stuff and it was just you know, like started responding to a lot more and a lot more and i think like one of the things you said is is not every city and town has the resources, but the fire service in general has the resources. So whether it's a, a town or city run hazmat team, a district team, or even a state team, we have resources we can pool. And I think like the life safety aspect for me is like, why do we get involved? Well, because sometimes these hazmat situations, somebody has to like be rescued and like, right. there's really nobody um, perched in a better position yeah. to do that in my opinion and, than the fire I service. Feel, I feel like in addition to like our, like baseline inclination to want to like assume these roles. I feel like in many ways, like a lot of these all hazards uh, approaches have been thrust upon us. You mentioned it. Like if people have a problem, like they normally like that yeah. they can't solve. They call the fire department. Yeah. 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 You know, if you don't, you if you don't specifically call the police, you call the fire department. Yeah. Right. Everything right. else is right. a fire department. And, and just think about it. You know, when you're at a, you know, family event or something like that and you're like, Oh, you're a firefighter. So I get this electrician's problem. It's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a exactly. minute. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, right. it's like, right. I, we know some stuff, but like right, by yeah. no means. But so people just look to us for yeah. everything, yeah. Right? which is and, which and I think which is really like, um, I think it's it's a it it's kind of an honor that people look to us like that. Like it's like to me, it, it makes me feel good like that we're looked at in in that light, and it also makes me think we have a responsibility to people yeah, to absolutely. like be good where we can be good. Like we're not going to be electricians and plumbers, right? But when we can do these other things and be good at we, them, yeah, we can point we in also, the right direction. We also, because we respond to emergencies all the time, we know how to respond to these emergencies. Right. And, and this is no knock against police or anything like that, but how often do you have police kind of like running into some of these emergencies maybe just a little bit faster than we would? Then you should. Then you should, right. but it's because yeah, the, their, their, training training is, their training is completely different. And so that's, right. that's not, that is certainly not a knock on police, but... It's just, uh, there was this time, but it was before I was a firefighter, me and my friend now who's a police officer, uh, we were with my friend who was a firefighter at the time and we saw this guy on a tractor on a hill and it had this big swinging blade on the back and we saw him sitting there. He was in a position where he was about to tip. So we saw him tip and we just like started sprinting towards the tractor and my buddy Dave just kind of hung back. And he just like walked up very slowly mm -hmm. and just sized it up from far away. And now we get there and we get pretty close. And then this long blade is like spun up underneath the thing. And it was like, it had like one tooth holding it in the ground. And had you gotten close to it and it let go, it probably would have sawed us in half, right? right. It was one of those things. So we're, we're kind of like running up to see if everything's okay. And he kind of just laughed at us afterwards. He's like, yeah, I, you know. You guys were like running up there trying to be heroes, you know. <laughs> yep. And he's like, and you had no idea that you know, there was some potential present danger there for yourselves. And so we just get trained in that light. And so when you run into a hazmat or something like that, you kind of have that baseline knowledge. It's like, all right, let me size this up right. yeah. before right. I just go headlong into something like that. And that's, and that just puts us in a perfect position to respond to these things. Yeah, Absolutely. I 100% agree. When you do that day in, day out, you know, yeah. we're, I guess, the people to call for that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, most of the time hazmat is um, like segregated from firefighting duties. Not that, like I said, you can't have a fire that turns into a hazmat or fires in general probably are. But when you talk about like specific hazmat response, oftentimes it's not, it's a specialized company that's assigned hazmat duties or it's a, a hazmat team or might be a district in a bunch of small towns that have a, a person from each department that responds or state team. Um, and hazmat companies generally have some higher specialized training. So, I know here in um, Massachusetts, the Firefighting Academy, you come out with your hazmat operation level. Well, yeah, right? OLR. OLR. Um, 
And so there are three levels to, to kind of hazmat response. So the first is awareness. And uh, we talk about like awareness is like they can identify that there is a hazmat situation. They're not going offensive generally in nature. Um, and they're kind of making notifications. So the person I would think of like a hazmat awareness level, and we kind of deal with these a lot, is, is like a, um, a safety person in a lab. So mm-hmm. they might not be on the hazmat team for that lab, but they're like the safety person. And they know like if Something there's a has hazmat, occurred. yeah, I'm going to tell people to get out. I'm going to call 911 and I'm going to get the MSDS or right. whatever, try to get information on what, what the chemical is. Um, the next level of that, which again, uh, if you graduate the mass fire Academy in Massachusetts, you're an operational level responder. So, um, usually these people are members of the fire service. Um, but they can be, you, you know, police do have hazmat and things like that too. But I think the state has its own hazmat so. team, I right? So, yeah. Um, so they have a little bit more ability to analyze the situation, decide on, necessary resources so is this a true hazmat that we need like the actual hazmat company or hazmat truck to respond do we need decon whatever the case is um and then they can do kind of basic offensive steps so if they need to make a quick entry for a rescue and turnout gear provided the situation is right they can they can do that they can remotely close valves so if you have like some of these computerized um like systems they can do that and then the, the last one is like the hazmat tech so um obviously you're a hazmat tech i'm a hazmat tech very, did you get your no. tech? No. You have your tech. All right. So we two two operations level and two hazmat techs, which is good for the conversation. Um, hazmat techs can take a little bit more aggressive ap- approach. They have a little bit higher understanding of hazmat situations and um, and using specific um, chemical resistant gear. Um, so just kind of want to go through um, what uh like the initial approach or initial considerations for hazmat are so um my idea is is anyone watching this whether you are a volunteer department somewhere or you're a major metropolitan department like we all should kind of have a general similar approach to the initial hazmat call Absolutely. and kind of what is that general um approach so um i'm gonna let you talk more into like like the the like meter selection maybe gear selection things like that um i just want to say like so one of the things you want to have going in is you want to have like what is the reported hazmat if you can so is it a leak is it a spill is it a tanker rollover is it in a lab whatever the case is like where is it um do they know the form it's in is it gas liquid is it a solid so you know it could be radioactive or whatever the case is um do we know what it is because that's a huge one. If we know what that's it is, that one. changes the game sure. completely, right? Absolutely. And then are there injuries or people that are symptomatic? So you've seen, um, everybody's seen on the news where they like evacuate a mall or something. All of a sudden, everybody in the mall is feeling sick. And that's another like, if you're responding somewhere and it's like, oh, there's a whole group of people that are suddenly sick, like in yeah. a space. Yeah. Maybe we need to that's, take that's that step point. back yep. and be like, not rush in there and be like, hey, Something, something's up. There's no reason that everybody here is having a similar symptom for kind of no reason. Sure. Um, and then I think you have to like make the decision. Is this a evacuation? Is it a, is it a chemical where you just need to get people out? Like, uh, this maybe like the chlorine rail cars, you know, out West or whatever, or is it a situation where you're, it's a recovery. So we're going to slow the pace down because the, ch- the ability to survive in that environment is not there. Or is it, a rescue and we have to make quick decisions to get somebody in and get somebody out. Yep. Um, so, uh, Matt, I just want to talk to you a little bit about when you have that information, kind of what your decision is as far as like making an entry and like, what do you choose? Do you make an entry in turnout gear, which is a level D I kind of, I have a, B and C here on the screen. Um, when do you kind of go with level C, B, A, what your thoughts are and like, Rescue versus recovery versus sure. chemical exposure sure. suits. Um, so I, I think there's a, a major push coming up now where turnout gear can handle a majority of the calls, hazmat calls that we go on. Right. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's they're, because, they're it's finally studied. So for a long time, it wasn't actually tested under those conditions, right? Correct. Yeah, it, it was kind of a, a no no. Um, you know, it's oh your gear is going to get sent away or it's going to get decommissioned or something like that. Right. So that, that was always a scary thing. But now it's coming coming around where a majority of these chemicals that we're responding to have an LEL. Right. And so I don't want to be in a, you know, plastic suit if this has potential for uh, an explosion. Yeah, right. that could be bad. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a major push in the fire service in, in the hazmat world is uh, turnout gear, which right. is, you know, what and we do. And we can get into it in, in quickly and, and bring a life safety uh, event 
to a conclusion, make a grab, do whatever. Right. Um, so I think, you know, that's initially turnout gear uh, is is the move. Right. Um, and then now we're also moving into uh, the NT94, which is kind of it's a hybrid. Multi-threat between, suit, yeah, yeah, multi-threat. Um, and, and that's kind of a hybrid between turnout gear and hazmat gear. Offers right. some spill protection, um, limited flash. Uh, and then but also the has, like, um, is reinforced, so for cuts and abrasions, where, like, that's kind of the downside when you get into chemical suits is they're not super strong against some of that stuff that you had to go in. Correct. Um, um, and, and just real quick, going back to, like, the turnout gear, a hazmat call that people don't really think about being a hazmat call that, Every single person goes on natural gas. Yeah. That is 100% a hazmat call with the threat of fire and explosion. So if you're going to that call, you're going to be going in turnout, right? Anytime it's like an oxidizer or something that has a high uh, threat of explosion or fire that we don't want to be in. We don't want to get shrink wrapped essentially. Right, right, right. No thanks. Um, I feel like if you're going into a suit other than turnout, you could be going in for a rescue, but likely you're going in for a recovery. And that's a tactical pause really evaluate the situation um so you want to talk about a little bit so the multi-threat suits are a hybrid what are they so i was trying to actually read if they gave them an a b or c rating and i it says that they meet all the requirements but yeah. doesn't actually say i think it's gonna be closer to a b yeah um and yeah so it because i saw somewhere you can put your pack underneath it and it has that seal for your face piece which would make it an A. So the big, the biggest difference between a level B and level A is that your everything is enclosed, including your respiration. Sure, right? sure. Um, but your regulator would still be out because of that seal. So it's kind of that's like kind a, of that gray area. That there. gray yeah. area. So they haven't really haven't really said. Um, but so so tell me, we'll work our way up to the top. So level C is is going to be kind of limited splash and chemical protection with limited respirator or respiration protection yeah. using a, a more than likely, or, you know, your hazard, you know, you're, it, it's not an unknown at this point. You've, you've deemed that this respirator, um, you know, is, is compatible with this chemical that, that you're using. So, right. you know, you're going to get extended, uh, operational time with a respirator versus a, you know, 45 minute, 60 minute bottle. Um, and those peppers just are filters, right? Like you're still using the. It would be similar atmosphere. to like a gas mask filter. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's, just, it's the same. I mean, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Actually, it's, yeah. it's a yeah. gas mask filter. So, if, if you're familiar with military, the the canisters that go on okay. have a have a specific rating for what they can filter, and generally, like you said, knowing what you're going into is a big part of that. Absolutely. Um, and then obviously, just with the level C, um, you know, you're gonna have a little bit more. Uh, to maneuver in, in that suit is going to be easier than, than a B and then right. uh, an A as well. Right. Uh, so, you know, pros and cons, uh, you have a little bit less protection, but you're going to be able to uh, work longer uh, and, and a little bit more flexibility. Yeah, you so, don't have a finite amount of air. Right. Um, just a qu- quick fun fact is uh, most people now have that fifth strap on their face piece, the top strap. That strap is actually for wearing pappers. So uh, so the reason that it exists is because the weight of putting a... It's not even called a papper anymore, right? It's got a different name. The canister filter yeah, or whatever you want to yeah, yeah. say. The weight of that pulls the top of your mask off. So that strap is literally only there for that, which is why if it's over tight, a lot of people that tighten that up too, and then they end up pulling the face piece off their chin. And so, you use your same mask for that? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. There's, there's a, a, there's a, um, there's a, a connection that you... Yeah. That, yeah, like a, an adapter we, of sorts. Yeah, we actually had to do it um, a couple weeks ago, and it was for a, a very long dead body. We couldn't get into the room without it, um, and we had to get the detectives in, so we kind of did a gave them a face piece to wear to go in to do their thing, and then we monitored them as a hazmat, which is an important part of hazmat. You always have to have oh, absolutely. somebody monitoring. Absolutely. Um, There's pushback against those, that like the fifth strap. People who were wearing them were saying that they didn't like them. They fit differently under their and helmets. And that's the and reason like is that. usually because they over-tighten them. Yeah. And when they, because the, okay. you get taught to tighten your straps. Yeah. But the problem is it pulls the chin up. Got it. And, and it's okay. there because when uh, you wear a heavy, our regulators aren't heavy, but when you wear out. a heavy a papper, it, Balances you need that holes. strap to, yeah. to, Got to, it. to okay. put it Counter- to your right. face. All right. And I wish I could take credit for knowing that for a long time, but I actually recently learned it from uh, Deputy White. He was talking about it. Um, maybe that's what maybe that's where i heard it from in the first so so just for an fyi just that tighten your mask and then just put that strap so that it's just not flabby keep it where you like it and yeah ever so gently yeah if you start leaking out of your chin piece that strap but uh so level b a little bit more protection um so level b we're talking about chemical resistance generally pretty good chemical resistance to splash um and vapor 
Um, but the big thing is that your air supply is not contained, right? Yeah, that um, that's a big one. Um, so yeah, the, the on the exterior of the suit is is the big difference there, right? Um, and also, you're getting into not necessarily uh, a, 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 a all always, but uh, the gloves are encapsulated, uh, so there's going to be seamless there, right? Um, so that's going to also be a, a benefit for you know, any type of chemical that we're getting into. Right. Obviously, we're not going to be swimming in, in this stuff. You know, you try to avoid as much as possible. Right. Um, but that's just a little bonus is to uh, have... You don't have to worry about it coming up your sleeves. Like sleeves. With, the, with the level C in turnout, you know, you still have that potential. Yes, um, yeah. And then level A, that's going to be our highest level of um, hazmat suit. And this is when you are working in the shit. Like you have a, say, a valve that bursts or something and you've got to close it down. Um, and you're in there with the chemical. And this is high, like, corrosion and acid resistance and splash protection, vapor protection. Your your air supply is contained. Um, and this is for, like, your real real nasty yeah. shit, yep. you know. Um, yep. And a level B could be for your real nasty shit, too. It's just a level A is probably when it's not as contained or, you know what I mean, like the chance of you being splashed or things like that are a little bit higher. And kind of back to uh, when it's when it's unknown. Um, unknown, yeah. Know, that that's could be an indicator between an A or right. B. So you have um, a bunch of people that, you have a valve that's leaking, a bunch of people that went down in an area or something like that. Nobody knows what it is, but you got to get in and at least try and tamper it. Yeah. Every time like I that. see a level A, it reminds me of that movie Contagion. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I like, refuse to watch like that Ebola. Movie. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, you know, it's like, like, a, like we, a, we're like lived it. We're <laughs> living it. It's yeah. like I'm not even gonna yeah. get into yeah. this. Yeah. 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 Um. So aside from the initial like consideration of gear, and again, um, like the turnout wasn't tested under hazmat conditions for a long time. They're starting to do that testing, so they're starting to recommend more. Like, hey, this can do a little bit more than you think it can, especially because you have full respiration protection. Um. So kind of considering that, that, uh, what you're going to wear. And then the next thing is like, what are you taking with you for tools? I yeah. think would be like your number, number two consideration. I'd take my ads. Yeah. I do, I do have it. This might be a stupid question, but is there ever a time where you'd wear your turnout gear and then like a level, like if you potentially needed thermal protection, if there's um, a high, that might be a stupid no, question. I, I don't think that would be a thing. Cause okay. it's I, the it's idea. Generally, go ahead. The, the idea of having turnouts on is, yeah, there's an explosive potential. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's one That's, or the other. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you're, I, you're really going to be talking that when you get into like corrosives, you know okay. what I mean, and acids and things like that, that you're not really worried about. A, okay. Yeah, I, th I think anytime you have that threat, you're just going to be in turn turn out, probably. Yeah. I, I think the closest sense. you'd see would be, you know, like a booty over your structural boot. Okay. Right. Kind of okay. you know, just any, any no, it makes or anything sense. like that. Um, you yeah. would be so hot. <laughs> oh yeah, no. God, you'd yeah. be so hot, that <laughs> thing. Uh, Brutal. So... I want to talk about tools. So, so we're going to get into a little bit, diving a little bit deeper into like some of the the technology that's out there that you're you're pretty familiar with, and like we have because of our kind of unique situation. But in general, fire departments that say don't have a hazmat team at all generally have a four or six gas meter, right? So, um, this is your first, in my opinion, first and primary tool for hazmat. And again, going back to that like natural gas call, this is something that you're going to take in. Yep. Um, so. Talk about a four gas and a six gas, and the six gas can be configured a little bit differently for different things. But the four gas, you generally tend to see the same four things on it. I, I would imagine, yeah. right? Most yeah, of, most of the time, or at least three of the four are the same. So that's going to be your your LEL, your oxygen, and then your your CO. And that fourth one sometimes I think can vary, like whether it's uh, hydrogen sulfide or they decide to do an ammonia meter or something sure. more, more specific to them. But do you want to just quickly talk about um, those those First three, oxygen, LEL, and CO, and kind of why they're important. Absolutely. So those numbers are telling you all the information, or not all, but a, a good chunk of the information that you need. Uh, so if, if you're a fire department with a limited budget, you know, go with a CGI and maybe a, a PID, photo ionization detection. Um, so you're going to get valuable information. You're going to be able to pinpoint the source in certain circumstances. So, you know, if you have an unknown odor in a room, um, these numbers aren't going to say what it is. It's not right. going to say, hey, this is chemical X, Y, Z, but it's going to say, here's the concentration of it, um, and, you know, th there's a problem. So and, and you can learn that from a lot of different things on the, on, the, on the meter. So first and foremost, again, going back to natural gas, is the LEL. So that is the lower explosive limit. Um, so one of the big misconceptions that you could probably kind of um, 
clarify is a lot of people think that when you're at ten percent of the LEL, it means that there's ten percent of the room is filled with whatever the explosive substance substance is, and then people also don't realize that these are very cross sensitive to other things. So there's a list of like I want to say like fifty different explosive gases that our meter is cross sensitive to at different percentages yep. right so yep. depending on what you calibrate your gas to the most likely scenario you're going to face it could be three times the lel when right. you're actually in there or a little bit less if you want to just just quickly explain that for people that might yeah not so understand. the conversion factors it has since fallen off the the meter but um you know we used to have those 40 50 chemicals attached to the meter itself yep and i mean some of them are, are pretty basic you know okay double that triple that whatever but right. you know to, to actually do the math is nearly impossible on scene but to get a General idea, um, depending on what your meter is calibrated to, mostly most of the time it's uh, methane because uh, that's just what we're seeing in the street and, and yep. in homes. So calibrate it to what you know you're going to be going into. And then, you know, industry might calibrate to something different because it's th their product that they deal with frequently. Um, but, yeah, so just to have an idea what that meter is trying to tell you, um, you know, if, if it jumps very quickly, um, you know, now that 10% that you were just talking about, you might be in it, right? You know, so th there's kind of a buffer zone there, but it's don't get too comfortable because right. it, it could easily, uh, jump, you know, circumstances right. change. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so for example, if you're calibrated to natural gas and you're, again, the, the meter's not going to tell you what it is. It's just that, Hey, something's here that's explosive and I can smell it. Yeah. Right. And so you, you're calibrating natural gas and for some reason you're somewhere that has pentane, right? I think pentane is one of the higher ones. The, the explosive range of pentane is basically like three times that of, of natural gas. So if you're reading a 10% on your LEL, you actually might be 30%. So one is that you always keep that buffer both because you don't know the chemical, but also because if I'm reading 10% at the front door, as I make entry into the house, I might be 30, 50, and then I, I'm 100% of the LEL. Sure. And so you want to tell people what that means when you're 100% of the LEL. It doesn't mean that there's 100% natural gas in the room. Right. I mean, there's, there's still oxygen in the room. Right. That, that's still going to be a factor, and that's going to tell you uh, on your meter. It's typically going to be 20.9. Right. However, if it starts to displace that oxygen, that's when you have a problem. That's when you need to go to respiratory <coughs> protection uh, and, and possibly back out and try to figure out what actually right. is happening here. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely like a, a the potential for, uh, you know, lull you into a false sense um, because... Yeah, right. you you can you can get yourself into trouble right. if you don't pay attention to that that little buffer zone. Right. Um, so 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 for example, like the like natural gas, I think the lower explosive limit is like three and a half percent or mm -hmm. something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty close to that. So if you're at a hundred percent of the LEL, it means that there's three and a half percent in the room, at least three and a half. Sure. The thing it doesn't know is it doesn't know if you're ever in too rich of an environment. I was right? going to say what uh, like so that's past the UEL, right? You're yeah, in the too rich to burn. Yeah. So, but the meter won't tell you that. It only tells you yeah, that there is that you're that you're at the lower explosive limit or somewhere above it, and that's where reading the oxygen now becomes uh, a big thing because what you'll see if you're if you if you start getting into really high levels of of anything that your oxygen 20.9 is typical. It's You're going to see that start dropping, right? Yes. So they'll start to be displaced by whatever. Right. Yes. So these things aren't telling you, hey, you have methane in this house, but they are saying, hey, you have something here. There's enough of it for me to smell it. Yeah. It's in an explosive range and you're displacing oxygen. So you have a lot, you have a lot of it in there, yeah, right? It's um, and then um, the the auction is is really important because one of the things that people don't talk about or or I don't say we want to talk about but don't realize is that that's not telling you all of the the, the air combined right so auction only takes up about one fifth of our total air the rest is mostly nitrogen, nitrogen. and then a little bit of a bunch of other things but if you have a one percent drop in oxygen you have a five percent drop in your total air supply, meaning that it is displacing 1% of this 20%, but it's displacing 5% of the total volume, which yeah. I know starts getting like talking about weird numbers. But if you're talking about that in part per million, parts per million, you, you actually have 50,000 parts per million of something versus only having 10,000 yep. parts per million. And that, that's, that gets non-survivable, survivable very quickly. Yeah. Especially yes. when you're dealing with, with highly toxic or, yeah. or VOCs and things like that, that put off a lot. So, um, we're going to do, uh, uh, I want to do it with you at some point, a meters misconceptions thing. So when we talk about this stuff a little more in detail, 
this stuff gets a little bit hard to explain without having like a, an aid to be able to like yeah. whiteboard and show you these yeah. different yeah, things, yeah. right? Um, and then CO is obviously another big one that we that we deal with, and especially um, when you're working in and around a fire, right, or or whatever. Um, and and again, these things are all cross sensitive, so sometimes you might get a negative reading. Yep. Right. That's still telling you something. It's right? it, it's not the meter, you know, going haywire. It's actually trying to say, okay. There's a, a, a wacky cross, cross sensitivity here, and the only way I can show you is by going to a negative value. Right. Uh, so mm. people will always report like, "Oh, this thing's broken. It's a piece of junk. Piece of junk." No. Um, you know, just as long as it's been maintained properly, uh, a negative reading is not necessarily a bad thing. Right. Matt, do you have a specific a specific example that you were in, involved with where you were able to like use that information, or do you or do you know of one that someone else was involved I, yeah, with? Yeah. Um. And I the, the chemical escapes me right now, but that's was, okay. Uh, another group had reported to me. They're like, "Yeah, we're, we we keep getting negative readings on you know uh, I think it was like PID two or something like that," and uh, I'm like, "Huh. Okay. All right." Um. You know, checked it out, put it on the calibration machines, and mm-hmm. everything was thumbs up. Um, and that, that's all it was. It was whatever, right. like I said, it escapes me right now. But um, whatever they were encountering is is that's how it's trying okay. to tell you. So right. you know, you gotta th- these things aren't out to get you. They're they're here to help, and right, they're right. gonna tell you the right information that you need. So anytime you have a change in there, um, you have something. And yes, I think one of the examples they gave for like the O2 was like carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide isn't going to trigger anything else on your meter except O2. And so you see like, oh my, my oxygen's being displaced, my oxygen's being displaced, and then you're like, oh, there's no LEL, there's nothing on my PID because I can't see it on a PID. And then we're going to talk about that with like the six gas. There's no CO, like you know, it's not cross sensitive to it. Yet you have a, a potentially fatal chemical yeah. there at high levels, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, knowing that every single one of these things is telling you something. So if it starts telling you something and you don't understand it, that doesn't mean don't pay attention to it. That means yeah. find somebody who does or figure out, hey, yeah. there's something going on here. I don't know what it is. Right. And, and a big part of that, too, is the maintenance, though, right? Like, so getting in, sniff testing it, um, making sure it's in within its calibration date, make sure you take care of it, make sure you clear the peaks, like different things like oh, that. Yep. Um, I think... I think that's something that's important too for like John and I as like awareness or operations level. Like we don't have to know like what is going on. We just have our like our four or six yes and need to know enough that like there's something here that is a problem. Mm-hmm. So like right. let's get out and get the appropriate right. people yeah. to solve it. And, and that's a, a, where like knowing like what is the call? Like did you get called to natural gas? Okay. Mm-hmm. If you got called to natural gas and you're not seeing anything on your LEL, maybe you probably don't have an, something explosive there. But then if you start seeing like, hey, my O2 is going down. Like something, there's something in there, right? Sure. So maybe they thought they smelled natural gas, but instead, instead they actually smelled something yeah. similar, but something is displacing yes. that oxygen, yes. right? So, Will, when you say doing the sniff test, is, is that the gas that you're calibrating it with? Is that what you're referring to? So so, so there's a, there's calibration, but like, so what I do is they call it sniff test or a bump test. Okay. It, what I'll do is I'll turn the meter on and I'll just take an alcohol swab. Okay. When it goes through its check, I'll literally just take an alcohol swab and go like that across it. And you'll see the Give numbers it a few change. seconds and you'll see the, the PID go up, the LEL go up, okay. you know, all that Got stuff. It. So just, it just is a quick, yeah. like, hey, my meter is, is working and in, in sensing things, you know, now, outside of calibration. Now, what's the gas that they use to to check these things in calibration? Uh, typically methane. It uh, is methane? So, okay. yeah, that tiny bottle. Okay. Um, so yeah, but it, like I said, it's all for the fire service. That's that's yeah. the go-to. But in industry, yeah, uh, it could be other things. Right. It's, it's and is it di- that specific chemical? Though, yes. Right? Exactly. Is it different across these meters? Obviously, they're monitoring different things, or do they? As far as CGI, yeah. Um, typically, for, like I said, for the fire service, it is methane. Okay. Um, uh, but it also could be different for a manufacturer. You know, got it. Uh, depending on if what they're, the they're making of, fertilizer, yeah. they might have their set to whatever the highest explosive potential is so got it if 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 methane's not their highest potential and pentane is right. then they might have a set to pentane yeah. so yeah. they might use pentane yeah. as so you can re- so you can get specific with these things based on what you're yeah you can get specific and 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 knowing that they're cross sensitive is important so just a real quick a real uh, an example of this is actually not from a from a cgi meter um this happened in a property i used to manage um uh, figures uh, yeah a plumber <laughs> a plumber was doing some work and he said hey your your co meter's going off and uh, I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, I don't think it's actually going off. I think it's just chirping dead battery. So I was like, all right. I was at the dinner. So I went by to check it. I get there. The thing is ringing like crazy. <laughs> yeah. So don't think anything of it. The key's been in there. There's no, like, the potential for CO is pretty low, right? So I, I, I 
get another one and I open it up and immediately it's ringing, right? So ended up calling the fire department for the city and they come came in. It was 100% of the LEL of butane in the living room where he had left his his uh-huh. t- um, gases for his torch. Uh-huh. So, so this thing was like, not CO, something's in Something. here. I smell it. <laughs> like, hey, something's messed up. Uh-huh. And if I hadn't done that, like that would have continued that space. So I had 100% of the LEL wow. butane in the living room of that, that house and had no idea. Wow. So that's just wow. an idea of the cross sensitivities for, for different mm-hmm. meters is they, like you said, they don't always tell you what you're seeing, but they tell you something, something is, is wrong. here. Right. And then you use that information be based on like the report, what the dispatch was for, whether it's natural gas or like, hey, a bunch of people just dropped in this Wendy's. And, you know, it turns out they mixed bleach and ammonia, mm-hmm. you know, or something like mm-hmm. that. So you, you use all of these tools to to affect like your your or to make your like your decision on what you're doing right? and with the the pr- you know product sampling meters we can cover cover that in, in far yeah more yeah because um, there's overlaps that you know they, they complement one another right one might, might not be seeing something the other might be saying hey yep 100 percent i know this is what it is this is absolutely so, here you know. and 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 i think that this is important because this is everybody on the fire service yeah every single person regardless of your hazmat level should have at least a working knowledge of this. Maybe you don't understand all the different cross sensitivities or different things, but everybody should know that if you're pulling this meter out and you've tested it in the morning and then it's calibrated well, and it starts showing something negative, positive, whatever, something's there. Yeah. And, and based on what you're there for, maybe you need to, to figure it out. I mean, this is a big reason we started carrying CO meters on medical bags, right? Yeah. It's because people are going in not realizing unresponsive is because they were working in a garage and they had a truck running in there all yeah, day right. or something. You know? well, what was so, that incident in East Cambridge? A couple of places like Layton Street. It was, a, it was a close call. It was a very close call. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember that? Not familiar. What, uh, um, they went in. It was a lot of, it was a lot of two's company. Um, I think Deputy Hugh put a whole thing out about it. Essentially, they went in for something slightly different. One of the firefighters like was like, call. we were here the other day. I'm just going to grab the CO meter or yeah. the CGI, whatever it was. Went in and they had such high readings of CO that it would have been uh, like fatal within just a few minutes had they continued to sure. the space where it was That's at. Right. So they started getting readings early, which is another important thing. You're getting readings here, but the chemicals coming out there, it's going to have to be a lot more yeah. over there, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe they had like IDLH. No, like, in the elevator room. I forget what the parts were million, but it was like it, lethal it, within minutes. It was yeah. lethal within a few minutes. And had he not. It was lethal within a few minutes, but, like, odds of being unconscious were very quick. And so had he not grabbed that meter that time, it's very potential that, that people would have gotten killed. hurt or killed yeah. on that call. And it was a, it was a run of mundane the run-of-the-mill call. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, so knowing that's important. So jumping up to um, from a four gas to a six gas, literally this is just it's two different gases and they're you know they could be interchangeable so you could have um if you deal with somebody somewhere that does a lot of refrigerant like uh like up here in new england ice skating rinks they use ammonia right so you might have ammonia sensor in there if you deal with a place that has a swimming pool you might have a chlorine sensor in there um for us this is actually a picture of one of our meters um i blanked out the sticker just because (laughs) i felt like i should um but you can see that four of the four of the things are the same on here so you have the lel on on the four gas it's called the ex for explosive i believe um you have hydrogen sulfide which is sewer gas you have um is that on that one yeah it is um you have oxygen you have co so those four are the same and then what we add on here is hydrogen cyanide and we add a pid so pid is photo ionization detector and just a little bit of background on that you can speak more to it basically when chemicals come through the sensor they give them an electrical charge they read how it comes back into the sensor and if they have a molecular value of 10.6 milliequivalents or less, we can see them. So there's not, won't see every chemical, but we'll see a lot of, yep. lot of chemicals on there. And generally, we're, when we're talking, about, we're talking about VOC, so volatile organic compounds. So these are, if you go to your hardware store, you're talking about your turpentines or paint thinners and things like this, things that have vapor pressure and put stuff off and that are generally toxic. Do um, you want to talk a little bit about the, the PID and what, like why we use that and what it's good for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just like you said, um, everybody's always doing some form of work in their house. And that example you gave uh, of the property they manage was perfect where it's, you know, 
the plumber just left some stuff and, and forgot that it was there, and that's now what is causing something to go into alarm. Right. Uh, and in your instance, the CO was not able to say at a, a certain correct concentration that this is what I'm reading. So a PID is going to kind of, as like you said, at that 10.6, as long as it was in that, that range, it's going to say, hey, here's the value of what that is. Right. Uh, so that could be, yeah, like you said, paint or uh, thinner, uh, anything organic, or organic compounds that putting are off. putting off uh, something that's going to. And the, the, big, the big thing with this is, so we talk about <clears throat> LEL is, is in percentages, right? Mm-hmm. So we're talking, when you're talking about a percent of the air, you're talking about 10,000 parts per million, right? Whereas a PID is seeing very small, limited numbers of this stuff, mm-hmm. right? So um, there are chemicals out there that 50 parts per million are lethal. If you don't have a PID, you're not going to see it on anything, right? It's not going to be enough to displace the oxygen. Correct. It's not going to be enough to, to trigger a cross sensitivity on your CO. It's not going to be enough to trigger an LEL. So this is a really important meter when you start dealing with like high, highly hazardous low volume chemicals right yeah. and and that go uh, that all ties in with uh doing your research as long as you have you know an idea right. of what the chemical may or may not be um you know that idlh is, is critical right. and that's how it's going to get uh reflected it, it, as far as the value goes right so so just uh, going back to john doing like a bump test or a sniff test on your on your uh meter if you run an alcohol swab pretty close to the inlet, you, you'll probably see some lel on there but if you take that same alcohol swab and rub it run it just in the air a foot away by the time it gets there, it's dissipated enough that you won't see any change in the LEL, but you'll still probably see a pickup on the, the part per million in the um, on the PID. Mm-hmm. So it's again, it's saying like if I took a lighter to that thing, that's going to be flammable because it's way percentage of the air around it is is highly flammable. But I don't wouldn't know that like coming in from this side of the room, and that's where this can start seeing those those things. And again, when you get into really like toxic substances knowing that there's even 50 parts per million is huge yeah. right i i like to think of the pid is almost an arrow and it's it'll truly point you to where whatever the hazard is right um i remember we were, we were at uh at the mall and there was a 5k so we were doing the sweeps before during and after and uh it had been raining so they moved the outhouses inside of this parking garage and so we get in jeez. Oh, okay why are we getting a pid reading right now Right. And we're just like, nothing over here, nothing over here. And then suddenly we look at the meter, we look up, and we see outhouses, and then yeah. it just keeps going more and more. And so, like, it was truly an arrow, and it was like, hey, idiot, keep yeah. going this way, keep going this way, because this is where the hazard is. Uh, right. So I, I thought that was a pretty impressive, and I, I've seen that a couple other instances where it's clearly telling you this is where it is. Right. And, you know, that's why it's critical to just pay attention to these numbers. Yeah. And it, uh, that stuff is... Like it's it's so important to know like these little details to, to like have again like if you're if you're the first person getting called off to to two people that faint actually this happened in Massachusetts it was like a Red Robin or or Buffalo Wild Wings or something yes. right yeah guy just drops dead mopping a floor right all right that you go in as a medical and you walk up to a bucket of bleach and ammonia you know what you're dropping too right. but you go in with this and you're like oh I'm getting some PID readings there's a dead guy over there back up. Is this a rescue or recovery? Yep. Let's figure out what's going on. You know what I mean? You, it gives you that like ability yeah. to make that tactical pause and knowing, knowing again to like take this with you on on that kind of call or something like that. And um, it, it's just really important. And I think like for any level of hazmat responder, or even if you don't have any level of hazmat response, like being a firefighter, you are subject to hazmat materials. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um. And then the other thing that we have on here is a cyanide meter. And for, um, I don't want to say for obvious reasons, people may not know cyanide, one of the biggest byproducts of combustion mm-hmm. we see in fires, right? So um, cyanide is a, a big a big thing we see. Absolutely. Um, any any other thing you want to talk about, about like these, these kind of basic tools and like maybe um, you do all the maintenance. So like what are good habits for maintaining these, Test not not calibrating them. That usually gets into which you do, but that usually gets into the higher level stuff. But you know, ways to test them or like when to bring them, things like that. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, from a maintenance standpoint, pretty basic. Just pay attention. Yeah. You know, if it says LEL Cal do, get that to whoever does your calibration. Clear out the peaks because that's you know could be from two days ago. It could be from your last call. Right. Uh, you just you want to have a fresh uh, zeroed out right. or, or 
not, not as far as that. And, and wait, just real quick for people that don't know, the peaks, these meters will keep track of the highest and lowest levels of something they've seen. So if you don't clear those out and you went into, a, say, a CO environment, and you came back out and you're like, well, what's what was the highest amount you saw? And you go to see your peak. Well, that might have been from a call, like right. you said, two days ago. Right. A good example of that would be, you know, maybe a con space where, you know, you put the, the meter on a rope, lower it as, as far as you need. And then you're going to be able to see what the yeah. highest reading was. And that's going to be, you know, a, a decision on, on how the event's going right. to play out. Um, so, yeah, clearing those peaks and making sure that's zeroed out is going to be a big one. Um, and... Um, you know, just giving a, uh, a a calibration as needed. Can can you can you talk through a little bit about turning the meter off and why it's important to run the meter and turn it off, like later on or whatever the case is, versus just when you're done with a call, shutting a meter yeah. off. G- give it That's some a time. That's a big to, one we see. I give it some time to breathe. You know, uh, try to clear that out and, and make sure it's all zeroed out, and then run the uh, the uh, zero calibration out, um, and just make sure it's good for the next call. I, I, that's that's a big one because yeah. you don't you don't want stuff in there, um, and it, if if you were in something severe enough, you might have to change out the filters and, and do some. And, and that's, further that's another thing. These these the sensors get saturated with chemical. Yes. And if you're in something that that oversaturates them, they have to be replaced. You yeah. can't. Mm-hmm. You can't. Uh, and and that that's kind of a pet peeve of mine where you see a meter clearly, you know, it says OR out, uh, out of range, and you just got a guy who's like. Right over a stove right. that, you know, that the, it's like, yeah, we know. Just bur- burn it, burn <laughs> the sensor out. We get it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's too it's, rich. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Right. So, you know, as soon as you see OR, just yank that thing because you got the information you need. You're not going to get anything more. That meter is not going to say right. uh, anything more. That's and, and what is the OR again? Out of range. Out of range. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. And yeah. It, it, you're going to soon be saturating that meter. Got it. Okay. So, All, right. All right. And sometimes you have to run these things for 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. You know, if you get, uh, you know, 700 parts per million of, something on your thing you might have to let that thing run 10 or 15 yeah. minutes to just really circulate yeah, that you're not air out it. and you know because that it, it's getting stuck it's the idea is that it's getting trapped in that sensor and oh, okay. getting red yeah that pump needs to do its job yeah and if you if you shut it off and then you open it next time well now your your zero is now whatever is still in that in that sensor right sure um another just a quick uh thing about about the meters is um is like knowing to depending what you go to right so you might test high you might test low. You might test kind of waste level, depending on what the chemical is. So, this is uh, maybe a little bit more advanced. But knowing, like, if you have an idea of what the chemical is, and you can look it up, um, and you see that it's lighter than air, right? If you're holding the sensor down here, you're probably not going to find it, right? right? Um, CO is a good, a decent one because it's kind of right on that cusp, and it tends to swirl around, so you see it everywhere. So, you know, whatever, hold it high, low, whatever the case yeah. is, but. But knowing what the chemical is can be important to being able to actually like pinpoint it because it's not going. If you're he, if you're going in for helium, and you're testing at the floor, you're not going to find gonna helium find unless it's the source, right? <clears throat> well, yeah, yeah, right. Um, but yeah, and and just checking uh, concealed spaces as well where right. that could be trapped where there's little air movement. Just make sure you know check those out, and right. that could be telling you something too. Um, butane's uh, just uh, butane's another big one. So it's so heavy, and that's where they have a lot of the. Uh, I think the 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 so the broad tree fire that LA just put out for the the pot shop that's how that that's what they use to like make extract the, extract the the THC or whatever it is from from mm-hmm. weed and that stuff that's what you get when you have people that do it in their homes too is they put it in their refrigerator and it just sits and sits and sits yeah. and sits and sits and then eventually it hits that that range and goes in so um, knowing knowing the chemical if you can is important and if you don't know what it is make sure you're getting readings you know yep. high low and and in the middle um, it's really important. Um, so again, like this is, it's hazmat can get so detailed, right? Like I, yeah. I thought we were talking about these meters for two minutes and then here we are. Talking <laughs> yeah. about my about my brain time. already exploded. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just trying to ask uh, <laughs> low level questions from a low level tech guy. <laughs> yeah. But, that, but that's important because like, again, like I, I would say that probably, what is it? Like 30% of the fire services career. Right. And so m- the odds of you as a volunteer or call firefighter, being a having their own in-house tech rescue is small, right? And even the career departments that have it, the odds of you having that in-house are small. A lot of times it's district, it's mutual aid, it's state teams. But that doesn't mean you don't have some obligation to know initially to, to, to one, be able to make the rescue when it's appropriate, or to, two, keep yourself and in, in the people you're with um, 
safe. So hazmat just has a lot of implications. So don't want to break your brain anymore. And uh, please give me a break. <laughs> but we're going to talk about, and this is just higher level stuff. So we're still talking, kind of talking about the basics of hazmat. So the idea for this next kind of section is to understand that that this is the basics, right? This is the the first step, and that it, from there, if you can get the information, then you can bring in the hazmat team who can say, okay, we need this, we need this, we need this, and can go in and test it. Generally, we're not cleanup. That's a misconception Correct. too. We only find, isolate, evacuate, rescue, and then generally there are companies that then come in and actually clean the hazmat up because it has to be disposed of properly and things like that. Um, but it's important that you can do this so that when you get the hazmat team there, they can use something like this. Not again. <laughs> so, oh, Barry, <laughs> real quick, quick question. Point out the Rigaku. Top left. All right. Yeah, <laughs> After learning the hard way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we talked about this before the show. Fun fact, um, before I went to hazmat tech school, Barry and I had uh, zero experience, really, with hazmat. Barry and, still uh, does have zero experience. <laughs> and uh, we got called to assist at a hazmat that you were on, I believe, right? You, was, uh, you, Paul was in uniform for sure. Yeah. And then, um, right. oh, because it was before you got promoted. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Paul, this is Paul way back. Was, uh, yeah. 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 Um, it was a very zen call, as I recall. A very zen call. So <laughs> it was a powder call. All the circumstances were that, hey, this is came from a weird place. It has a weird address. It's addressed to some high level professor, like, and it's leaking a white powdery substance. None of which hit on PID or any of that stuff. So now you have to go forward into actually testing the substance to say this is hazardous or not hazardous. Um, long story short, we went up. Your LT at the time was like, "Hey, Will Barry, go grab me the Ragaku." Barry and I were like. Uh, sure. Yeah, sure right. Thing. Sounds yeah, good. I know exactly what that is. <laughs> so we were going down in that cabinet, just pulling. I think we actually took the wrong thing one time, yeah. and then so Maybe. we took the wrong thing up. And he's like, "Nah, the Ragaku." So we went back down. And we're like, "What the fuck is a <laughs> Ragaku? Is that real? You know what I mean? Like, I've never heard of this. Man, it's fucking nice. Um. So, so Maddie, this is uh, this is this is where your bread and butter really shines. Is you you not only maintain these meters, but you're extremely knowledgeable in what they are and why we would use them. So. In that in that scenario, we had it ended up being I think calcium carbonate, right? It was a, it was literally it was a Zen was garden so that somebody had mailed that the like sand had leaked out. But it was again, it came from like a weird thing from, but it was overseas to a professor who was like, I don't expect this package, yep. which happens a, a decent amount with us because of just the 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 um, colleges and the labs and stuff that we have. Um, so so this is just kind of to get into like like we don't have to get into super detail, but just kind of to show people again, like that, that is the basics is being able to identify a four gas and, and go in and turn out gear and make a rescue and make some identifications. But it gets, that allows someone like you to come in and decide this is what I want to use. Right. So in that, in that instance, I'll, I'll, we'll just use that as an example. Initial team makes entry. I think it was you guys anyway, but say initial team makes entry. They say, Hey, we have a, a substance here. We don't touch it. Obviously we used a PID. We used our, our six gas. It didn't. We didn't get hits on anything. It is definitely suspicious in nature. Um, and then, hey Matt, you have to make this decision. What are you going to do? And in this case, it was Rigaku. So you want to just tell us a little bit about these different meters and Absolutely. technologies and why so, we use them? Just to backtrack, by by there was no situation, no hazmat situation where we're not going to run the CGI over that or PID. More than likely, you know, a white powder is not going to have enough vapor pressure to give off a reading, but right. you still have to clear it. Right. Um, and to kind of sidetrack a little bit, um, if we ever, if this white powder did in fact have nefarious intent behind it and we do have to submit it to the state lab, they're going to ask if we ran a CGI over it. They're going to ask if we, uh, checked radiation and then they're going to want the, uh, pH. So, right. So they're not going to accept anything corrosive. They're not going to accept anything with uh, a rad source. Right. So, so while we won't clean up, we will take samples if, if it is nefarious in nature and hazard so if it yes. was say the the big a white powder we would be i don't know if maybe we would but in theory we would actually be collecting the sample of that packaging it and then it would be you know there's like the um custody of evidence yep. there's a there's a very specific process and it's important especially on our end because if this person was trying to do harm and we don't do this part right 
they get off because of the custody one. of evidence yep. because you didn't mm. do it right. So, so there, there are some, some very like big ramifications from not understanding how to do this to, yes. to your point. So, so you, you want to make sure the lab gets a majority of that sample. We take as little as we can for a public safety sample. So we can say to the, you know, building management, you can reoccupy or no way is that, right. you know, so we're only doing for public safety for an instant, um, reading and, and to give them an answer, a little bit of peace of mind. Right. Uh, but yeah, really the priority is the state lab uh, or anything above that, right. which uh, is, is, is the gold standard for uh, determining what's what. Uh, so kind of in your situation, back to that hazmat with the, uh, the Zen garden, um, a lot of people will look at these different meters and they'll say, okay, they must do the same thing because they all look the same. They all function relatively the same way. But that can't be further from the truth. You know, right. there are certain chemicals, there are certain substances that the Ragaku can see, that the 908, the, the device to the to the right of the Ragaku will see, and, and, and vice versa. So it's all complementary where you have your big three, the FTIR, Raman, and uh, mass spec. And so when you get all three of those working together, you're going to get a, a decent idea, but there are still certain exceptions to the rule. Right. Um, like you, you talked about the big A, like, None of those are going to pop up on any of those three meters. So you have to go right. to an even more advanced level. Right. Um, so to know that each one of these meters is speaking a different language, but they're all trying to find the fingerprint of what that chemical is, or they're all right. trying to you know translate what that chemical or substance is, is, is putting off. Um, so not to get a no reading is not a bad thing. Right. From one of these meters, because if you are paying attention, it's showing a signature. It's just not in its library or it doesn't have the ability to detect what that substance is. Right. So we're in a huge advantage where we have multiple uh, pieces of technology where we can run and, and, and test. Uh, so that example of the Rigaku, um, yeah, I mean, it, it probably would have been best to do all three of those just to right. test all at the same time. Um, you know, plenty of sample. Obviously, there was a whole box of, of that right. white substance. So, you know, if we truly did need to send it to the state lab, we would have been able to determine what was ours and have plenty right. to send to the state. Um, so, yeah, meter selection, basically, those three are, are the big ones. Can you talk about um, FTIR? Yeah. Um, That's the one I, I have. Like, so so um, there's ramen. There's mass spectrometry, and then there's FTIR. And I think we, we had a conversation about this because we got called to a meth lab. And I was like, all right, well, I'm obviously bringing my six gas, but, like, what's the next step? Yeah. And FTIR was, was your answer, if I remember right. I, I was uh, in a town. Different a, town, a different, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that was a different one. Um, that was IMS. Oh, okay. So that, that is also doing uh, some form of air monitoring. Okay. Uh, but it's also going to be able to classify what that is. Okay. And, 908 can also do that. That's a whole side get, story. Get in there. Yeah, get we're, we're there. getting deep now. But um, so yeah, but the FTIR is also a, a very uh, useful tool. No, no question about that. Uh, it's getting more towards the destructive side. So like you actually are altering the substance when you do take this sample. So it's flame uh, for your thermal infrared. So it's IR. Okay, IR. Sorry, uh, but it heats. It, it heats it, it, the to a certain extent. Yeah, but you're also potentially crushing it, which okay. is. Uh, you know, the state's not going to... Right. Anything above us is not going to truly appreciate um, gotcha. uh, evidence that's been crushed. And, and So what different. would make you grab, like, one of these versus the other? Um, so... Based on, like, what you think... I'm going for be. all three. Oh, you're going yeah. to use all three? Okay. And as a matter of fact, so we, we have soon going to accept uh, a new FTIR device. Oh, nice. And we were with the contractor who's given the training. And th these companies admit that, like, they can't cover everything, like, right. which is awesome. Like, it's not awesome that it's just awesome that they admit it. And so, so you're not like, getting any false pretenses going in. You know what's up. He's like, hey, we can't do this, can't do right. this. We can do this, this, and this. Perfect. Um, so this guy was basically like, take your sample on your FTIR. There's a you know circular area where you can take your FTIR uh, and, and do your sample. So you can operate the Raman laser, and then with the residual that's remaining on that, the, the disc of the FTIR, then that's when you can use your, your mass spec. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like you, you have the product contained and you're reducing the hazard by just having it in this One tiny thing, little area. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
so yeah, so that's an awesome part. Right. Um, so, so just uh, just um for for you guys and for yeah, like say, people. So totally I totally got yeah, all yeah, that. Yeah. So <laughs> so the way that these things work, a lot of them is they either shine a laser or a light or they heat the substance. And so for like a, a, I want to say ramen, and this is where please correct me if I'm wrong because you're way way above on me. But they they shine a laser, and the way that laser refracts. Every we'll, we'll substance has a refraction that they can measure. Just think of it as a fingerprint. Yeah. And and so, so they see what light comes back to them and gets refracted. And by the amounts and the lights and whatever, they can say, oh, this is what I see. This is okay. this matches this profile. So basically they've, and, and this another one is they have libraries. So not every chemical or substance is in here. So they have libraries that they know I've done this to. This yeah. is what it yep. looks like. And then um, you can go from there. So like the 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 ragaku will do that on bulk substances, right? Yep. So like actual granules of of stuff. Whereas like the nine oh eight, which is this top middle picture, does it what they call trace detection, and that's very very it's small. Amazing, amazing so, technology. So if you had a if you had a say a liquid that you were going to test, right, that was on a table and you were going to use this, you have to like get a little tiny little sample, rub it on a test strip, rub that strip on a test strip, probably rub that yeah. tri- strip on a test strip till you get a microscopic yes, amount of this yes. chemical yeah. and then it will actually goes in heats it and then reads what it off puts and it and is that along the same lines of it not being too rich to burn out a sensor exactly. yes okay yeah. yeah so it's it's basically preserving itself by it. not allowing you to overload with too much yeah. substance okay um, and um, then there's, 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 uh, I don't, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. We'll come back, but there's also drawbacks to stuff like that because if you're testing a flammable explosive substance, you don't want to put it in something that's going to heat it. So then you have things like, um, the Pendar, which is a laser, but it's certified sort of like our natural gas lasers that we have mm-hmm. that it doesn't heat. And so you can, um, you can still send that laser to it and get a reading off of it without potentially also disrupting, which, which, which you guys did too, right? You guys had, you guys had to call Martinello, Schmeyan Schmartinello. <laughs> Had a call, I think, and they tested something with the ragaku, and it actually burned. Like, yeah, we we have been, we've had a, a yeah. bit of a streak lately, and you yeah, know, I, I think um, the substance it, it it wasn't super dangerous, so right to actually alter it in that sense wasn't the end of the world. But right, um, but yeah, but it can it's, it's possible. It's possible. Right, um, and that's the benefit of both of these ramen technologies that we have: the pendar and the the, uh, the ragaku. You can set timers, so if you need. 15 seconds to back off and you know you 100 percent. you have to test this this substance um you can do that right and, and kind of give yourself so what is ramen like what does that mean when that's what i'm saying where it shines I'm, a laser i'm thinking of ramen noodles it reads, it reads the fluorescence is it called fluorescence yes it's yeah the fluorescence it, it, it's the, just the guy's name the guy okay. uh, yeah. so no noodles not involved. noodles not noodles, no noodles. No, the no, first no, time no. i heard it, i was like ramen technology. chicken or beef <laughs> i'm pretty so what, good with what, ramen technology <laughs> man i was yeah. which uh nailed. which one of these i know we have one that like you can point through glass and um it should detect is that the animals? ramen and the pendar right yeah to a certain extent uh the the, the pendar and i believe it's i don't know the exact numbers but certain angles it's not going to work at certain obviously thicknesses of glass yeah. um the the like the if there's a do substance well. in a car clear, or something clear could, glass not yeah. Brown glass. So right. if you have, you know, a vial and the substance is perfectly happy being in there and you can, you know, just adjust as proper as you need, um, you know, that that substance is not going to gut out and, and, and bite anybody. Keeps, it's going to keep it yeah. safe. So, uh, so yeah, that's an awesome technology to have to right. be able to just not even open it and expose anybody uh anybody to it so right. yeah so so the so the ragaku can do liquid and solid and again it's like bulk sampling so it's like bigger granules and and things like that um and then the, the 908 the 908 is pretty interesting because it has mission specific profiles which yep. are pretty cool you want to talk about those a yeah. little bit yeah um so the idea of the 908 and and this might take a while to wrap your head around bulk versus trace so when i think of bulk i think of costco where you buy you know Jar of mayonnaise is exactly, big for yeah. five bucks. When in reality, bulk means if you can see it. Trace right. means you cannot. Okay. Okay. If you take a salt shaker, or you know, you gave the example a minute ago. If you take a salt shaker, put it on a table. That's too much for this device for the nine oh eight device. Yeah. So you need to, you know, maybe Just touch it. Touch <laughs> it. Yeah, and then and like you said, dilute, 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 dilute. Then it goes into mission specific modes. Um, it's a threat detector, and so. That's one of those things where people will say, oh, this thing's a doorstop because there was clearly a white substance and it didn't come back with anything. Well, 
it didn't come back with anything is because it wasn't a threat or it right. wasn't a precursor. It was calcium threat. carbonate, and it doesn't care about calcium exactly. carbonate. Exactly, yeah. Um, so people will discount these things because of that. Um, and in reality, yeah, it's it's trying to tell you something that it's just not, it's just not a threat. Which is important. So so lack of information is still information. It is and has not been. a bad and, thing. And it's a hum- hugely important piece of yeah. information because now we know, okay, it's not on our PID or it's not on our LEL. It's not reading on our threat detector. So yep. we don't have an explosive threatening substance here. We can probably scale back what we're doing or whatever the case is because we're still going to try and identify. Yeah. yeah. But we don't we're not as afraid of it, right? Are there any right. have there been any instances where like you guys use all this metering technology and are unable to determine what it is but you know enough that it's inert and not threatening? Like are there any times where the means I, w- water would be an example, and the Pendar now does that, right? Yeah, water yeah, might yeah. be an example. So, so none of these things see water well, which is weird. So, if you <laughs> have a liquid, <laughs> okay. so take, much of it. <laughs> it the, the problem is, is it refracts so much light, it can't get readings yeah. on these things. So, but the the newest one we have can well, sometimes. I'm just thinking of like, like, you know, obviously in Cambridge we have a lot of innovation where they're coming up with like new substances. Yeah, where like it's potentially not in anyone's library because it's a that, new... That's absolutely... Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I was at a... Reach hazard. back? Reach back, yep. So, um, I want to say... Is that where you call? Yes. Yeah. So, you can... So, I was talking to Reed about this. I don't know if you're... They, they I, like, reach back for... It was, like, Saren? Uh-huh, yep. Okay, yep, yep. all right. They can we talk, Saren? Can we talk about that or no? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if it was actually that, maybe not. It was Trace Elements. That yeah. probably wouldn't. Okay. Yeah. We'll leave all it right. off. We can talk about it afterwards. Okay. Um, but uh, to, to answer your question, Matt, so again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but, but doing reach back is they can see that it has a similar profile to something else and be able to tell you like it's in this family maybe yeah. of chemicals versus like what it, act, what it is specifically, maybe not, but like, oh, this is a, 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 a base. An consider, base consider or, this uh, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then and then that's where like the labs and stuff and testing really goes in, and and that stuff really comes down to whether you need to do it or not. Maybe it's just a cleanup because it was in a lab and nothing's nefarious, and maybe it's a state has to test it because somebody got hurt or whatever the case is. Um, so yeah, reach back I think is is kind of where you would go. But yeah. water, like I, I like to use the example of water too because it's just one of those things like you're like. You can't tell me that. Of course, water. of course. It's water. I have <laughs> I had this like something burned and there was a jar of this and you're like. See me, I'd no, be it's like, like a clear liquid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's vitamin water. Right. Very you want to talk about the smell. beginning of the pandemic? Yeah. We're <laughs> what, are we, what are we talking about? Mixing chemicals? Oh, no, I don't. I'm all set. <laughs> we'll talk about that one off air, too. Yeah. Um, all set. <laughs> but, yeah, as, as far as... It pneumonia. Yeah. That's all you need oh, to know. All right. So we go. Um, but, yeah, so as far as reach back goes, uh, these companies have uh, scientists on call 24-7 where... As long as you can get to uh, some form of a laptop, email them a file that's generated by the sample, yep. they will compare that sample to basically a gold standard of what they think it is. And then, you know, it's all, it's way, way above anything that we, we will ever Yeah, do. these are like really smart people. Yes, very, very <laughs> smart people. And they're, Not me. They're comparing it to a gold standard and then taking what you have um, and, and they're saying with a certain amount of certainty that, yes, this is it or, or it's in that family. Or, right. Um, you know, you can tell the building owner that they can reoccupy or evacuate a yeah. million miles away or something. And, and uh, for, for our call, did they identify that chemical on scene or did that actually end up at a lab? That, they found out it was it was a mixture of peroxide and something else that made parathetic, para, parasitic acid. Yeah, that ended up in the lab. Uh, yeah. I, I, I can recall uh, there was a, a fine line where, between where I was able to dress down and then I was able to get to the hazmat truck. Right. And my hands are still burning. And I'm trying to use, like, I, I put gloves on because it's, you know, safe. Right. And um, I'm like, this, this is crazy. I, I cannot be doing this. Like, I, right. I'm not accomplishing anything right now. Right. And it, you know, it it hurt a little bit to see another hazmat team come in, but it was like there was, there was no it's other option. Can. Until we knew um, what it was, it, you know, you, you have no idea. And that like, was a, a day or two later. Right. And so, um, yeah, we weren't able to 100%, 100% classify what that substance was until... Right. Days later, but that was based but on they the samples were pro- that were taken. I'm guessing, and obviously this is all speculation because it wasn't there, but I'm guessing they were to say, hey, it's in this family. It's an extreme acid because we tested it with PHP. So we're going to talk about some simple. Yeah. Like this is not, I mean, it's technology, but this isn't like you need to know a lot kind of technology. Yeah. Um, and then uh, and they say, hey, this is what it is. Get that sample and then get it out. And then 
they were able to come back to us. And for peace of mind, I think we all kind of realized after we washed our hands. And, and um, I just want to give a shout out to uh, to Rob McCarthy on that call because he came in and set up a decon center, bro- broke out the soap, and like had people getting decon yeah. quick. Man, he was he was on it, and there was a, the whole engine one crew. I think that night, Dave Jones and, and uh, whatever. So just a, sh- a shout out to them. Those guys did a great job. But. I may have given my helmet to that company to so, co- wash down and then return to the truck. I so. Don't know. <laughs> I I had the unfortunate assignment in that that scenario to be asked to bring a chainsaw in to cut the floor open before we knew that it was a chemical because they were having a hard time because it was so th- like such thick hardwood we were having a hard time. So because I was operating a chainsaw in a small room, I put full SCBA on because I didn't want to die from carbon monoxide. Has met. And, uh, hey, and so, but the, the problem was it threw... I mean, came uh, all the way up. Oh, yeah. My turnout gear is on my helmet. It was on my face piece. Gloves are where it got through for, I think, just about everyone. Yep, so I that's why the hands were bursting. Eye. Yeah, I think um, Schmall Mahoney got it in his mouth and was like, that doesn't feel great. Uh, um, oh, but because brutal. of that, I was like, I wanted to put my helmet back in the truck. But I was like, I have it all yeah. over everything. And especially not knowing and what it is. don't know what it is. Yeah. It wasn't a small amount because of the chainsaw. Yeah. I sent it out. It came back looking brand new. I was very sad, pup, and uh, and we were on a super hot streak of fires that just yeah. ended. It's um, not your helmet; it's your experience and leadership that defines you. Well, Ooh. thanks, Barry. Yeah. Well, I was, can always count on Barry for some like solid wisdom. It's He's a good dude. Um, good so, girl. so moving on from the tech, the 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 big technology, and again, like I, I just the point of this is to highlight that it goes so much further, and like, bro, when I talk about hazmat nerds, Matt, like you're a hazmat nerd, but not like. <laughs> Not like the guys, you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. these people know it just goes so deep. And I, I'm not saying that you don't know, no, you I, know, you know a lot. I cannot claim that. You I just can't also claim have, to get as, as deep as those. But guys. you also have a personality. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's the right. important balance. That's, that's the important balance. You know, if you, if you can be smart and have a personality, yeah. man, you, you got it made. So I, you're doing, you're doing pretty well. Sick. Um, never tell you to your face, but you do pretty well. <laughs> um, so, so, so those are kind of some of like our big like meters that, that can kind of start getting us into places in the, Listen, this isn't even probably a tenth of what we have on the truck when you right. start talking about biological agents and nuclear and radiation and all this other stuff. Um, but I just wanted to give real quick two examples of specific meters that you might see. So um, we actually had hazmat the other day, and I, I didn't know this, but um, I think I was on ladder three for it. And one of the one of the meters on ladder three is actually an ammonia meter. Um, so that yellow meter bottom center is an ammonia meter so again like if you have a known identified target hazard you might have a meter specifically for that one mm-hmm. thing um so if you have and, and i think theirs is for refrigeration because of the labs the rescue also carries ammonia yeah i mean rescue yeah you guys carry a little bit of everything and then we have the hazmat truck that yep. has um whatever you guys you don't have um and then again if you have if you're working out west where they're producing chlorine and T- and tra- trucking it or putting it on rail cars or whatever, or you are a community with a lot of pools or a pool or whatever, you might see a chlorine meter or something. Scottsdale, like Arizona. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Something like that. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly talk about, there's a lot of papers, there's like aqueous papers and different things, but one of the things that can tell you a whole lot of information very quickly with zero ability to not have a battery is pH paper. Yep. Do you want to talk about it, what it is, why it's important? I mean, if you go back to, if you're one of those departments that doesn't have a huge budget, any of those papers that you named is, is an easy solution and really, nothing's really right. cheap in hazmat, let's face it. But that's one of those solutions that is going to tell you a whole host of information that's going to say whether it's an acid or a base or, you know, dead in the middle, which is ideally right. what you want. Um, we actually, we had a, a different hazmat the other day where the initial report was mustard. It was initially mustard gas, and then it was changed to hydrogen cyanide or sulfide? Sulfide, I believe. Hydrogen sulfide, I yeah. I think. Um, and one of my first thoughts was going to the papers, so the, right. the M8 and, the, uh, and, and K and, and, and pH. Um, we didn't end up going to that, um, but had that atmosphere been overly saturated, you know, CGIs, yes, they would have uh, pinpointed and, and got us in that direction, but the papers really would have come into play at that point. Um, right. And, and, you know, doing so, something as simple as, you know, to your mask or to y- your sleeve or something yeah. like that. They call it a, a bear claw. Like you just stick a, a 
well, it's not just pH. It's when you put the pH and the K and the M80 and whatever all down, right? And it and it's just a, a bare claw of yeah. papers. And walking into an environment, you can see a change pretty. And wetting them helps, but yeah. like you can see a change pretty rapidly as you walk in with no other meter. And that's important because especially the people are afraid of acids. Acids aren't the scary ones. Right. Bases are the scary oh, yeah. ones, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you start seeing stuff that's that it, we're talking about getting corrosive, right? Like acids and bases, you know, like, hey, if I'm getting that in vapor, right? Because that's what's touched. So you can touch it to a liquid, but you can also get it in a vapor. So if you put this paper, uh, you know, you have a vial of a chemical that has a high vapor pressure. And it's you. what you'll do before you ever touch the, the chemical is run it over and then run it down in case it's heavier than air. And those vapors alone will get there. And they're going to be caustic the same way... Um, the chemical is caustic and that's important because if that gets in your lungs, see you later. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's bad shit. So, yeah. um, yeah, that's like important knowing that and having those, like having somebody that has that thought, right. Going in. Cause we, we went on that call too and we don't carry all the same things you carry, but when you said it afterwards, I was like, yeah, that's obviously like, that makes sense. You know, that's something we, we would, or at least maybe not do, but at least consider and be like, Hey, okay. We have all this other things that we're taking in. So we don't necessarily need to do that. Yeah. But if you, don't have all these other things. And that's a quick, absolutely. Yeah, quick and, and just think, I mean, I, no one would have, but on that call that we, we got transported on, imagine if we had just one little bit of that, the answers right. that we would have had right off the bat. You're, it's an acid and it's burning your skin. Yeah. Like period. It, it would have mm. not solved the issue and right. not given us a hundred percent certainty. As well, you know, it was, you know like, okay, this is a, this is a general decontamination method for yeah. liquid acids yeah. that are burnt. You know what I mean? Right. Like, so you can't discount the relatively low tech stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You can't discount it at all. Yeah. And, and, and that is, that, that is a basic thing. So I wanted to show like, like that hazmat can get super, 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 super involved. I don't know really any of it. Um, yeah, it really sounds like you don't yeah, know cool anything what you're well, talking about. Geez. I don't. I, oh, this whole be, time. I'm going to give credit where credit is due here. A lot of this is I've had conversations with you because we get calls, and I'm like, Maddie, what, what is this? What would I do? <laughs> like, if I got here and you weren't here today and your crew was up torn apart or on another call and I came to this this potential meth lab, like, what would you take in? Like, what would I take in? And then, And then, you know, it's a commitment to, like, kind of actually, like, learning the stuff which i think is a, a huge like um just credit to your personality and like what you bring to the table is hey i have this training but i don't know all of these things that i think i should know if somebody says if somebody comes to you if you're the hazmat tech and you're on a hazmat call the deputy might come and be like what do you think and you might be the lowest private on the call yep. but you're the hazmat tech yep. and you know you can play that game of uh, maybe it'll never happen but also, it, maybe it will. It has the possibility to happen yeah. very quickly. Yeah. And you better have an idea. Right. Um, and if you don't have an idea, tell them you don't have an idea. Cause That's the most important. And bring some, is, get that knowledge, you know, like just equating that to like to like forcible entry, right? Have plan A, B, and C. Yeah. And recognize immediately that plan A is not, not working. working. Right. Plan yeah. B is not working. Over my head on this. Yeah. And, and move because especially if it's a chemical that you know is being released into the air and people have the potential of getting sick whatever like you need to you need to know that shit sooner than later yeah. and bring somebody that does um and there are some resources i didn't put them here but i'll put them in the video description um we can throw them up on social media your erg is a great guide for initial responses um the niosh book is a is a great guide we i have an app on my phone i don't know if you guys use it called wiser mm -hmm. have you heard of that oh yeah um wiser is a great asset and wiser is good because if you know the chemical and if you know the approximate quantity you can literally put in what direction the wind is blowing what the chemical was what state it was in how much of it was it a, a a large spill or small spill and it'll give you an evacuation and yeah, it'll say it's pretty cool. App. It'll 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 you can put it on a map. And it'll be like you are here. You need to yeah. evacuate this far, this yeah, yeah. area. And it's like synced with distance. like Google Maps. Yeah, so it's, you can it's like a pretty see sick it. app. Yeah, so um, I'll th we'll throw uh, um, we'll throw it up on social media. Link to the description. Awesome. Um, anything else that you want to talk about? I mean, I when you we started talking about you know what uh, research uh, resources you have, you know, we talked about that that subject matter expert that you know they spend 40 plus hours a week in this lab or yeah this whatever it is this occupancy they know when things are out of whack different so yep. utilize them as long as they're healthy and, and able to right. you know contribute they know what's up and they know that substance they know that device they know they know what's out of the ordinary and what's normal yeah and us walking in 
like you know that the lab we walked into the other day couldn't tell you i couldn't tell there you what's supposed to be there, there what's not supposed to be there yep and so um just to use Hood those systems people. operating yeah there. yeah yeah don't don't discredit these people like we are this is a big we are not the experts yeah when it comes to, to like we, might, we have a working knowledge but if when you start talking about labs and specific chemicals and things like that those people are absolutely yep. the experts so listen, that's huge. listen to what they have to say yes yeah. and, and and take it in which you guys obviously did and um everything worked out didn't end up being mustard gas i don't think i don't think it was no <laughs> pretty pretty good <laughs> um anything else you guys you guys have to add no i think that's enough for uh <laughs> yeah i pretty much told you everything <laughs> i knew already yeah <laughs> No, no, Maddie, we really appreciate you. Yeah, like, yeah, no, thank I'm you. filling in gaps as I go, yeah, and it just highlights me like you have so much to learn and and do in this yeah. career field. Yeah, um, I, I think again, like hazmat is one of those topics that it can be really dry to talk about with the wrong person, and so that's why yeah. I was like, oh, I want to do a hazmat episode. Like, for, I was like, gotta yeah. get gotta get Maddie on because you yeah. have personality too, which is uh, <laughs> which is pretty pretty great. So uh, again, I just want to say thank you for coming. Really appreciate thank you for having it. me. Appreciate it. Yeah. A lot of thank knowledge. You, I hope you know, like in any of these episodes we talk about, I hope that people watch them because there's just so much to learn, and I think you you brought a lot to the table, and I really appreciate that. And then another just big shout out to your wife. I know two hundred two <laughs> man. That's a uh, that's a challenge. Yeah. So we appreciate Fun her uh, share, sharing you yeah. with us, especially <laughs> coming off of twenty four. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, guys, um, uh, please make sure that you, um, subscribe to the channel, like our pages, share this stuff because that's uh really important knowledge and, uh, we will see you next week. Job talks out. <laughs> <laughs>